Well, that's the first thing about Tolland Mayer. Now, the second thing about him is extremely interesting. He was so very well preserved that the contents of his stomach were all there, and the experts in Copenhagen were able to study it and were able to say what his last meal had been. Now, we've reconstructed this meal with the assistance of uh, Miss uh, Wally and uh, Dr. White of the Dietetics Department of the London University. And now I'm going to hand you over to our prehistoric early Iron Age cook, uh, Noel Middleton. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to my prehistoric kitchen. Well, i better begin, I suppose, by telling you what I'm going to try to do. As you've heard from Glynn and seen for yourselves, Tolland Man was extraordinarily well preserved. And when they examined him in the museum in Copenhagen, they couldn't find any traces of sickness or any damage to his body other than that caused by the hanging. So we know that the expert's table of contents of his last meal is accurate. And we know roughly what his last meal um, consisted of. Incidentally, it was eaten about um, 12 to 24 hours before he died. We know roughly what the proportions are, and we only um, know very roughly how it was cooked. We've only certain clues as to how it was cooked. The first and uh, foremost thing about it is that there's no trace of meat whatsoever in what was found. And this may seem strange, but it is borne out by other evidence from this time. Hunting weapons were hardly ever found in the graves or the remains of houses of this period, and few bones were found in refuse deposits. Earlier, they, they did uh, live very much by hunting and fishing, but by this time, there was very little game left, and um, it was much too precious to kill off as meat. They, they did have their um, domestic animals, of course. They had sheep and cattle, uh, pigs, goats, and, uh, but these, these particular ones were much too, much too precious to kill off as meat, and um, we know from this, except they, they sometimes kill them on very special occasions, I think, but we know from this that Toll and Man's last meal was vegetable. And it consisted of the following seeds or grains. First of all, there was barley. Uh, barley, which you can see here, and there's a picture of it. And it was the um, foremost means of subsistence as far as corn went at this time. And then next there's linseed. It's a rather light sort of coffee color, these small seeds, and um, it's the seed of flax. There is, of course, one slight disadvantage about eating linseed in large quantities, and that is that it's got a well-known laxative, uh, laxative effect. But this can be overcome if you soak the seeds in water for some time, or you can um, boil them up and then drain them off very carefully, which is what uh, we're doing with the ones we're cooking for Glen and some water this evening. And if any of you would um, like to try out this prehistoric recipe, well, I think you should soak them to do the same. Then there are camelina seeds here, and uh, they're very, very tiny, and they're a product of the mustard family, and they were probably cultivated along with the flax. And like linseed, They've, they're very rich in oil, and therefore they're very valuable as a food. Then there's pale persicaria. See the pale persicaria? And this is the picture. Oh, I think that's upside down. And this may be more familiar to you because it is, it, they're very light seeds, and uh, they are found very often on waste ground. And these seeds have also been found in many Iron Age um, uh, sites. And it does seem as if they were either um, cultivated specially or if perhaps they were the main object of seed gathering expeditions. Now, those are the main, the main ingredients. And then there were other seeds, but they were found in smaller quantities. Uh, they were probably picked by a mistake or just if the seed gatherers happened to come across them. There's corn spurry here, which is very, very dark and tiny. And um, it's found usually in cornfields. And then beside that, there's the sort of wild brother to um, the swede or turnip. And they're uh, very tiny too, and they're rather like miniature marbles, and they've got little colours, sort of yellow and dark red. Um, and then there's um, white goat's foot, um, the side that, which are <coughs> very tiny and light and a sort of olive green. And there's the picture of that plant. And then we have um, wild pansy, 
just a few little seeds here, or heart seeds. Well, now, those are the um, main contents. So, what are we going to do with them? Well, we're, we're not going to roast them or bake them, because um, if they had been roasted or baked, there'd have been some signs of burning, and none of them had this. So that means they couldn't have been made into bread. Um, the first bread which was found in this part of the world dates from 400 AD, and it consisted of a, a charred bun, which was made of uh, barley and gravel. And the next bread was 400 years later, and that consisted of coarsely ground peas and spruce bark. And there you are, neither of them sound particularly attractive to me. Well, anyway, to get back to Tall and Man, um, he could hardly, I suppose, have eaten these seeds raw. So if they weren't roasted and they weren't baked, the only thing that's left is boiling. And um, there is evidence which sort of fits in with this, because some uh, bowls, um, pots, were found, um, clay pots with a crust round them, and this does look as if something like soup or porridge had been boiled in them. And um, anyway, porridge has always been a very popular dish with the Norwegians. Well, now, there we are. Um, how are we going to prepare this gruel? Well, I've got an enormous cauldron here. And we'll start off by putting in the um, barley. And then the linseed, which has been very well soaked. And then the camelina seeds the pale persicaria, and then the sprinkling of the other seeds. The, there you go, it's a bit far over. Now they're all in, and then you add some water to them, quite a lot, because of course they soak up a lot. There's about two pints here, and I think that's about enough. And you stir all this round. They are, of course, just floating now, because um, until they're cooked, they won't swell. And you stir it constantly. You keep it over a low heat for, um, oh, I think 10 hours. At the end of 10 hours, you've got a jolly good Iron Age gruel. Now, the only thing we've left out of this um, is a, a spoonful of fine sand, which Tolan Man had in his. We didn't put that in out of consideration for Glenn and some water. Uh, um, oh, we are, of course, using only dishes and um, implements that they might have used at this time. Uh, except for the fire here, because uh, we couldn't build a big log fire in the studios for obvious reasons, but I'm sure the effect on the cooking won't be very different. Now, in this cauldron over here, we, we have got a gruel which has been cooking for 10 hours, and uh, the ingredients, you'll have to take my word for it, are exactly the same as the ones we've just seen here, and I'm going to dish this out for um, Glyn and some water to try. Uh, there is one other thing, um, what they might have had with it. Uh, they could have had um, salt, or um, honey, or milk, and none of these would have left any traces, so I've asked Lynn and some water to choose what they'd like, and they've chosen salt. In colour, it's um, a rather sinister-looking purpley brown. I'll put a little bit, little bit more into this bowl here. You see it's speckled with the, with the seeds, and when it's cold, it sets quite hard, so they might have eaten it, Cold, or they might have sliced it up as a, as a sort of cake. Well, I think that covers everything, um, except what they might have had to drink with it. Um, well, we know from um, the Greek explorer Pythias, who travelled to Denmark about this time, it was about uh, 330 BC, and we know from him that the local inhabitants then drank mead or barley. So, uh, or mead or <laughs> beer, I'm so sorry, beer. And um, we brought along some mead to the studio to complete this meal. So while Glyn and Sir Mortimer mortify themselves with this, I'll bring over the gruel for them to try and just put the salt on first. Have you got your spoons? Drink yes, I've got our spoons. Skull, skull. This, I suppose, we need to break down our resistance That's to the right. ordeal which is to follow. Yeah. Dreadful. We've got your spoons. Skull. Now we um, proceed, I suppose. Mm. Very good stuff. Mm. Now, you try first. No, no, oh, no, I think you try first. Do we? <laughs> yes. Mm. It's not as purple as you. Well, go, 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 go ahead, Ben, go ahead. 
Mm. Is it delicious? No. <laughs> Lynn, is, is anyone looking? <laughs> Don't tell me the linseed effect has worked already. <laughs> Couldn't have it. Anyway. Do you know I've solved this problem? Have you? <laughs> How do you mean? If, if one could be frivolous in the presence of these solemn relics, mm. I would say that the poor chap of Tolland committed suicide <laughs> because he could stand his wife's cooking no longer. Very good. <laughs> what I say is for a little more animal. And a little less vegetable. vegetable. <laughs> There's too much vegetable. There's too much vegetable. And not and no mineral. mineral. No <laughs> mineral. <laughs> Salt or sand. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, no well. Anyhow, we'll drink to Tolland Man, if not to this diet. Bless him. Score. Score. Good stuff. Yes, it is. It's much better than the porridge. Oh, yes. <laughs> I'm right. sorry. Right. I think I, I'm trying to agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> well, now, strengthened by that rather odd dish, let's now push back even further into the prehistory of Denmark.